In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Tonight the conference is on interior freedom. But before we actually uh, before we actually talk about what interior freedom is, we need to actually talk about what freedom itself is. There's a misconception, it started with some of the modern philosophers, and they basically said that freedom was a lack of external coercion, that you were free because you weren't being forced to do something from the outside. But in the end, that means that someone who, something that is completely predetermined could be free, because then, it, yeah, or something that is completely predetermined interiorly could be free, because as long as there was no external coercion. So that definition is what's called an extrinsic definition. It doesn't get into intrinsically what um, freedom actually is. St. Thomas and the moral tradition of the Catholic Church defines freedom as an attribute of the will by which it is able to choose between goods. In other words, it's something in the will that gives it the ability to make a self-determination in relationship to one thing that is good or another thing that is good. It's a common misperception that you can't really be free unless you have the ability to choose evil. That again is a modern notion. It is completely false. While it's true that God allows us to choose things that are evil, St. Thomas says it's not natural for us to choose evil. It's not natural. He says, in fact, it's contrary to the nature of the will, because the nature of the will is supposed to be choosing what is good, or between goods. And so he calls this ability to kind of force yourself in a certain sense to choose what is evil, he calls that the flexibility of the will. You're kind of flexing the thing, kind of making it do something that it's not really designed to do. And so when you choose something that's evil, you're pursue, per, uh, choosing it under some aspect of the good. So that in the end, what real true freedom is, is the ability to choose between different things that are in themselves good. This means that people in heaven are free. They have a choice to choose different things in heaven. In hell, everybody's will is fixed on evil. They have a reduction in their freedom because they don't have the ability to choose other things anymore. They're stuck on this one thing all the time. And usually it has something to do with the, in the area of their, what they were damned for, the sin that they were damned for. So what's interior freedom? Well, the term interior freedom, so now we know what freedom of the will is. Sometimes freedom of the will, or freedom, interior freedom refers to the freedom of the will, but it can also refer to an interior state in which our emotions are, there's a certain freedom, that they're not being fixed or pulled in one direction or another all the time, etc., by different things. Different, different authors use the word that's contrary to interior freedom as the Latin word is the gare, to be bound. That you're somehow bound to something that you can't quite get away from interiorly. So your emotions are kind of stuck on something. They can't be uh, let loose of it. St. Um, John of the Cross refers to our attachments as threads that bind us interiorly like it does um, a thread that would bind a bird to a branch. Now the reason he calls it a thread is because the, the, the bird could break the thread and fly free but very often it looks at the thread and thinks that it's much more powerful than it actually is or it doesn't want to break the thread. Okay, so when you're talking about imperial freedom we have to talk a little bit about, so we want to get a full understanding of what this interior freedom actually looks like. Saint Ta the word in Latin, it starts, uh, if I remember right, St. Augustine was the one who um, coined the term. It might predate him, but he was the one who coined the term. And from that point on, it was actually used historically to, um, for the word free will. 
the free will in Latin is actually liberum arbitrium. It literally means freedom of judgment or free judgment. Now, why is this important? It's because the church says, for example, if you didn't know that something was morally sinful when you did it, even though objectively you might have committed the mortal sin, subjectively, because you didn't know, you're not culpable for the mortal sin because of that lack of knowledge. Now, basically what that means is the church is saying that your freedom was compromised because you didn't know what you were doing. So that in order to choose between goods, the will is a completely blind faculty. It can't know anything on its own. It can only choose between the goods that are presented to it in the intellect. The intellect has to see these goods or see a particular good from different points of view of whether we're going to choose it or not. So in order for the will to be able to perform its function of going from one direction to another, we have to have intellectual clarity about the thing we're choosing. Otherwise, our freedom gets compromised because intellectually we don't understand what we're doing and so the will doesn't have that same ability to choose because what it would choose, it may not see. If it could see it, it might choose something differently. So that lack of intellectual vision gives the results in our loss of freedom. Now this intellectual, the intellect presents the will to the, or the object for choice to the will. But our intellect heavily depends on our imagination. Now the intellect in a human being is a variety of different faculties um, that include everything from the imagination to the memory to what's called the cogitative power, which has the ability to make associations. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. It's, it has the ability to make these associations. And then um, uh, it's that image in the imagination. We abstract from that what the nature of the thing is. Then we make a judgment about that. And the way we make a judgment is we have to look back at the image in our imagination. So for example, if I was to say, if I was to make a judgment that say the grass is green outside, I'd actually either have to have in memory or actually be looking at the grass outside so that it'd be in my imagination for my intellect to be able to judge, yeah, the grass is green outside. In fact, truth is defined as the adequation of the intellect with the thing. It means that what's in my mind is adequated. What does this word adequate mean? It means that it is basically the same as what's in reality, that there's kind of an equation there, that there's a proportion between the two, that the grass is green in reality, and in my mind, the grass I recognize the grass is green, and so I know the truth. If I thought that the grass was purple outside when it was actually green, I wouldn't know the truth. I'd have an error in judgment, which means there's something wrong with my image in my imagination if I'm thinking of purple grass when in point in fact I think that this is what the grass really is there's an error in my judgment about what my imagination is telling me okay, what does this all mean? it means that in order for me to have a free choice of the will my intellect has to make a judgment about the goodness of something in order to make that judgment of the goodness of something it needs my imagination so if I have the wrong images then what's going to happen is it's going to compromise my judgment and therefore it's going to compromise my freedom. Okay, one more step before we kind of tie together to see what this real freedom looks like. Our emotions are moved by what's in our imagination. So if I think of something um, in my imagination, it's very delightful. So as I often talk about how men really like steak, right? They like meat. So I think of a steak and in my imagination, I think of the steak, and then I make a judgment about, you know what, I'd like to eat steak tonight, and so that's that, that the possibility of eating the steak is then presented to the will, and I can make the choice, but in seeing the steak, my emotions will arise. When I have that image of the steak, my emotion for desire for the steak will begin to arise. When that emotion begins to arise, that experience of the emotion gets merged with that image I have in the imagination. In other words, in my imagination is also the emotion that's part of that. When, I can, when, my, when my intellect looks at the image to see, you know, whether the stake is really good or not, if I have a really strong emotion in relationship to it, the emotion will cause the stake to look better than it is. 
St. Thomas says that judgment of the truth is not judging a thing greater than it is or less than it is, but as it is. When things are evil or difficult or painful and our emotions of sorrow or anger arise, we tend to think that things are worse than they actually are. We see this all the time with anger. With anger, someone will do something and it makes us angry and then we lash out at them and at the time we're lashing out, we think that this is just and due to them. But later, after the emotion clears and we have a better perspective on it, where our judgment is clarified, in other words, we have a clear judgment of it and we realize, oh, this person didn't deserve this. I shouldn't have done this to them. And so what this means is, is that in order to have real clear images so that I can have good judgment, and therefore have freedom, I need to have my emotions under control. So that the person who's got all the virtues, and so all of his emotions are under control, that is, he has clarity, and so as a result, he's got the right images, he's the person that is the most free. Today, people think that freedom is getting to follow your particular emotions wherever they go. That is completely contrary to the truth. That in point in fact, full freedom is had only when our emotions follow upon reason. What does that mean? Well, there's two kinds of emotions. There's the emotion called antecedent emotion. That's the emotion that arises up contrary to or uh, before reason has the ability to make a judgment. So we all have experienced this, we'll be angry when we don't want to be angry, or we're sad when we don't want to be sad, or intellectual, we know I shouldn't be sad, or I shouldn't be angry, yet we still feel these emotions. That's antecedent emotion. And that is caused by the image in your imagination. Then there is consequent emotion. Those are the emotions that arise out of thinking about something. So over the course of time, you start thinking about something, and then you become angry because you realize that these people have done something against you once you kind of pieced it together intellectually. That's called consequent emotion. The perfect freedom for an individual ultimately consists in having no antecedent emotion. None. Why? Because if you have any antecedent emotion, it affects your images and then affects your judgment and then that compromises your ability to choose to some degree. Not entirely. Sometimes we can choose something um, knowing intellectually this is, this, you know, even though emotionally I'm angry, intellectually I know that this person doesn't deserve this so I'm just going to sit on it, etc. But you're not as as free in that moment. Why? Because freedom implies a certain kind of levity or lightness in the ability to move from one thing to another. St. Thomas says that if you look at the nature of which, how God designed the soul, it was designed to only perform, really, predominantly, only one operation at a time. In other words, we're really only designed to either think or to choose, um, and when our emotion at, at one time, right, so we perform different kinds of functions at, at any one time, and if we're going to perform a different kind of a function, we have to switch from that activity to another activity. We can't be doing all the activities of the soul all at the same time. It's just not possible for us as human beings. He says this is because of the unicity of the soul. He says as a result of that, when our emotions get really, really strong, because of the vehemence of the emotions, what happens is, is the interior faculties, he says, come, becomes bound by the emotion. We've all experienced that, where we've had an emotion and we don't want it and we, we have a hard time switching away from it. We have a hard time thinking of anything else other than it. We have a hard time just thinking sometimes in relationship because the emotion is so strong. Okay, so what this means is, is that if there's any antecedent emotion, there's an automatic decline in the amount of freedom that you have actually have. So interior freedom then, we have to think to ourselves, okay, so what are the things that compromise this interior freedom that I have? And by the way, freedom also means freedom from the emotions dragging you every which direction. St. John of the Cross makes the observation, he says that the, the emotions, he says, you know, any attachment, any love, any attachment that you have to anything whatsoever can cause all the other emotions to arise out of them. St. Thomas says that 
all emotion arises out of the passion of love or the emotion of love. Now, there's different kinds of love. There's love that's, that's our emotions. In English, we would say, I like it. So, for example, I like steak. So, I, I, have the pa I can have the passion of where I'm thinking of myself, yeah, I like steak. Okay. That's different from intellectual love, which is um, my will chooses to will something good for somebody else. And then, of course, there's the love of charity, which is a distinct thing. It's an infused virtue charity by which I'm able to love people for God's sake, okay, and God for his own sake. So what this means is, is that from love, St. John or St. Uh, Thomas says, all the other emotions arise out of it. St. John of the Cross says that from attachments, all our emotions arise out of it. Now, attachment is another name for love. Anytime we are attached to something, created, then what it means is, is that if something happens to that created thing, we can become emotionally upset. Take, for example, the, the mother and the father, they're standing on the 50-yard on the line watching the football game, and little Johnny's running down the thing with the ball, right, and they're yelling, hey, Johnny, go, 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 and the next thing you know, some kid who's like 100 pounds heavier than him comes over and just slaughters him and knocks the ball out, right? The parents, because of their attachment to the child, see the child as being injured. And then as a result, they want to beat the little kid, the, the, beat the kid up that plowed into their kid to set things right, right? That's anger. Perception of injury with a desire for vindication. So anger arises out of their love or their attachment to the child. Sadness. We become sad because we don't have the thing that we want. We, we become... Um, uh, we could actually desire. Desire is something that we, uh, the emotion of desire is something that we desire, something that we want or that we love, that we would like to have, but we don't have it yet. Fear is the perception of a future evil that cannot be overcome, but it's a future evil to the thing that I love. So if we know, for example, in our case of many parents will look at their children, they know they're not leading life, and so the parents can kind of develop this fear that, you know, something bad is just going to happen to that kid. You know, I hate to see it, right? So there is, and even hatred rises out of love, because you, you love something, and then when it's acted against, you learn to hate the thing that's causing the damage. So all emotions arise out of the passion or the emotion of love. Now, another name for that, John of the Cross, called attachments. So, when you're talking about those things that start affecting our interior freedom, the first thing that oh, um, is, is our attachments. What are we attached to? Any attachment to anything created whatsoever will result in a lack of interior freedom because we find our attachment to that some thread or something that binds us to it, and so as a result, it's harder to choose contrary to it. Our Lord even said, you know, he who does not turn away from mother, father, field, etc., all those things, you know, will not have the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? It means in heaven, everybody is absolutely free. But in order to have that absolute freedom, you have to have freedom from the things that are binding you. John of the Cross says you have to have absolute detachment from everything created, even your wife, your husband, your, your house, your work, your job, your finances, all of it, you, and your children, everything. <clears throat> and then people say, well, wait a minute. If I'm perfectly detached from my children, I'm going to neglect them. No, that's not the case. We're not Zen Buddhists. What Zen Buddhists do is they become completely detached so that they have absolutely no emotions or mo no interior activity at all. Well, that's not what we were designed for. We're actually designed for contemplation of the divine essence, of course. But what it means is, is that instead of attachment, what has to take its place is charity. When you love God and then you love your wife for God's sake, you're no longer attached to your wife, you're attached to God. But it means that from that charity will flow rightly ordered affections, desire to see what's right for them, doing better for them. In fact, your love will be more consistent. One of the things that absolutely drives me out of my tree as a priest is the translation that they have that says, love is patient, love is kind. No, it is not. Charity is patient. 
Charity is kind. Charity uh, lasts through all things. It's charity that does that. And charity is the will, the virtue that's infused in our will by which we're able to love God. The, the love is the act. It's charity. In fact, if you look in Scripture, if you actually look at the original languages, they all say charity. None of them say love. None of them. It's charity that uh, is the one that's patient, kind, you know, it doesn't, isn't puffed up, it's, it's humble, etc. So when a person has charity, the kindness, the patience, the, the affections, the solicitude that they're going to pay to their spouse will actually be more consistent, more authentic, and deeper. So in a certain sense, then it means that the reason you'd seek the detachment from them is because John of the Cross put it this way, any time you have an attachment to a created thing, that means that attachment's also in your will. Because even if it's in your emotions, there's also a concomitant weakness in your will and relationship to the thing. And so there, it's taking up a certain space in your heart. And as a result of that, that's that much space that God can't take up. God is a jealous God. He wants the whole banana. He is not interested in sharing your heart with anyone. Not your spouse, no one. So what he wants you to do is he wants you to love your spouse, love your children, love your parents for his sake. And then from that, you'll be detached from them and then all that interior freedom will result from it. You won't feel bound. So what are the things that really make us bound? Well, first part that makes us bound is just the effects of original sin, of a proclivity to evil and concupiscence which is our forms of inclining us, which kind of bind us. Concupiscence is basically in the concupiscible appetite. That's the appetite that has the desire, that can desire things. And so without, if we're not careful, our desires for things can kind of quickly flame up. It's called the law of the tenders. That if we don't keep these things constantly under wraps through practice of virtue, then as a result of this, our emotions get, get out of control again. Even if we get them under control, they can get back out of control if we don't keep working with them, keeping them under control. So the first thing is, is original sin kind of did a number on us. We're not as free because of original sin. But the effects of original sin can be overcome through virtue and through grace, okay? Which we're going to talk about how you gain that interior freedom. The next thing is attachments, of course. The third is our own disordered habits. The term vice means that the person, it means weakness, ultimately. Now part of the reason that sometimes people aren't free is because they're so weak that they don't have the volitional strength to choose the thing that they would like to choose. And so in a certain sense that weakness binds them. And so any weakness means that you're, there's a lack of freedom, interior freedom. But the interior freedom, if, when you have it, results in a kind of a peace that you're, because you're freed from other external things, that as a result of that, interiorly, there's this peace, this contentment that kind of settles in. One of the mistakes that people make, if you pay close attention to the way Christ was talking, he was trying to point out a common mistake that human beings make all the time. And it could be wrapped up in this, and then I'll refer to Christ when he talks about it. One time there was this one nun in a convent, I can't remember if it was John of the Cross or um, Padre Pio, but she wrote the letter to him. He was a spiritual director, her spiritual director, and she wrote to him and said, you know, I'd be a lot better uh, nun if it wasn't for all these other nuns in the convent. And he wrote back and he said, oh no. He said, it's their imperfections that are the means of your sanctification. Christ said, when you see the speck in the other person's eye, look at the plank in your own. What he was constantly trying to get human beings to do is quit looking for the source of your problems from the outside because that's not where your real problems come from. Your real problems come from how you choose to react to those things interiorly. Your real problems are your own interior defects, your own vices, your own weaknesses your own proclivities to sin. That's where the real problem is. Because a person who has perfected, had gained perfect virtue, they can be around the most obnoxious of people and their, their interior peace is never unsettled, never. 
So part of this is uh, a serious examination. If you're going to gain, and you have to start looking, okay, what is, what is my defects? Any vice is an inclination of, your, of one of your lower faculties or even your intellect or your will towards something that's disordered. Now that inclination kind of pulls us. Now someone who's really free is someone who can just kind of do either one with ease, right? And our vices and our defects that pull us, our inclinations, disordered inclinations, pull us in a direction that make it harder for us to really do the things that we should be able to do with ease. So what this really means is that the more virtuous you are, the more interiorly free you are, the easier the spiritual life actually is. St. Thomas, building on Aristotle, observed that the reason that the moral life was about building virtue was because once you become virtuous, the moral life becomes easier. It's easier. People say, this is really hard. Yeah, that's because you don't have any virtue. If you would work on the virtue in these areas, then once you gain them, you begin to realize there's a certain ease that can be had in relationship to the very thing that you used to struggle with in the past. In fact, detachment is the ability to take something or leave it. So a person who's detached from steak, if someone says, you know, hey, would you like steak or would you like chicken? And he thinks to himself, well, right now I really need to eat this for my health. So he can easily just choose the chicken. He doesn't have to have the fat, juicy, dripping steak. Okay. So, but the point is, is that our vices and our virtues <coughs> are the things that corrupt our interior freedom because they move our, our appetites and they affect our judgment. Our vices affect our judgment because they, they move our emotions, but they also make things seem harder than they actually are. Again, that's why John of the Cross used the analogy of the thread with the bird. It's not as hard as the person thinks. He can break the thread if he wants. Another thing that can compromise our interior freedom, to which we don't have, initially, we don't have any control over, but over the course of time we can, is diabolic influence. The demons can move our lower appetites or they can affect our imagination and as a result of that they can corrupt our interior freedom and upset our peace, upset our joy, etc. And so part, ironically, part of interior freedom is the spiritual battle. A lot of exorcists will say, and people who have been possessed or people who have gone through extraordinary diabolic influence will come out the other end saying, I feel purified and I feel freer than when I went into this. Because of the fact that through the grind of the struggle and everything that they actually develop a lot of virtues that they get to a point where they're actually freer. But the demons can compromise our lower faculties, God permitting, and as a result of that our interior freedom can be compromised. And that's why the spiritual battle is an integral part of every person's desire to attain interior freedom. We actually have a natural inclination to choose. That is, now that does not mean that we have a natural inclination to self-will. Self-will itself is a compromise in freedom. Because when a person's self-willed, they're fixed and stuck on themselves. Whereas the person who is completely denies himself, the person who completely gives himself over to God and absolutely surrenders to his providence and surrenders to his holy will is the person that attains true freedom because of the fact that they're not bound and fixed by some created thing or themselves. And so as a result, that's why, you know, the more you uh, love God, the closer you come to him, the freer you actually are. Another area that can highly compromise our interior freedom is our woundedness. Everybody's wounded. You know, it's an unfortunate reality that uh, a lot of people think that this whole discussion of wounds and healing is a charismatic thing. Eh. The charismatics picked it up, that's true, but if you actually look at the tradition of the church, it's all over scripture. It's all over the ritual of the Mass. In fact, we say at Mass, et sanavater anima mea, that my soul will be healed. And it's also, we see this um, uh, in the book of Isaiah, it says, through his stripes we will be healed. St. Paul says, through his wounds we will be healed. 
It means that Christ allowed himself to undergo the physical parts of the passion in addition to death, but the other parts in order to heal our interior and exterior woundedness, to heal those. So why does woundedness affect us? Well, if you look at the nature of a wound, it makes us more sensitive. When we're, you know, like if we have on, the, on our skin, if we've cut it, it's more sensitive for a while. And also, um, we tend to, uh, and if it gets touched, it causes a lot of pain. The same thing is true about our interior woundedness. We're all wounded from original sin. We all have the four wounds of original sin, darkness, the intellect, weakness of the will, proclivity to evil, and concupiscence. We all have that, every one of us. We overcome them and conquer them through leaving a life of faith and virtue. Okay. But then we also have... Uh, all the woundedness, it still falls in those same categories from our own sin. Every time we commit a sin, we get stupid. Let's parse that out a little bit. St. Thomas says that, and the whole moral tradition says with him, that you cannot choose evil as such. You can only choose the will, because it's by nature designed to choose between goods, it can only choose evil under the aspect of the good. How do we do that? <clears throat> it's very simple. What happens is, is this. When the intellect makes an act of judgment, of conscience, and recognizes, you know, this thing's evil, but there's this good thing attached to it, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. There's pleasure attached to it. I really like the pleasure, you know. But it's evil, too. You know, I know that this is immoral, so I shouldn't do it. This is presented to the will for choice. What happens is, is the will can't choose it quite yet because of this evil that's attached to it. If the person decides that it wants the pleasure, he wants the pleasure, what the will has to do is the will has to move the intellect to remove the evil part, to ignore the evil part and focus on the good and choose that, which is contrary to the way the intellect is designed. The intellect is designed to know the truth. The will is moving it contrary to the truth. Action contrary to the, to the nature of a thing, that is the definition of violence. The principal effect of violence is weakness. Anytime you do violence to a thing, you weaken it. Every time we choose evil and do that process in our intellect, we get stupid. We get dumber all the time. Is it any wonder why when you look at our culture that is just steeped in sin and wickedness, that it's just getting not just it's not just getting insane. They're getting dumber. I mean, people literally can't even do even elementary things in some cases anymore because we've become so sinful. So darkness of the intellect results. We just, we, and if we keep doing that, over the course of the time, the intellect becomes habituated to not judge this thing in that manner. And so what it does is it starts judging things contrary to the truth on a habitual basis, and then that's when we lose sight of, I didn't even know, that's when people say, I didn't even know I was doing that. We literally have lost sight of it. Then, of course, the will in choosing something that it knows is evil, really, even though it's choosing under the aspect of the good, has this, now it has this inclination to evil and it has this weakness, it has malice. Then, of course, from that, it loses lose our lower faculties, like our irascible appetite, which is the one in which we get angry, so we get those things out of control, and then the concupiscence arises because we're choosing things contrary to reason, etc. So as a result of this, all our lower faculties, every time we sin, every, all our faculties just get disordered when we sin. Not all of them in each sin, but when we sin, some of our faculties get disordered. That disorder is an inclination towards something evil. That inclination then, therefore, detracts from the freedom that I would have interiorly. Okay, so back up. When we're wounded from our own sin, because a wound is something that causes pain, it causes damage to the thing that it wounds, it causes weakness, it uh, causes the sensitivity, etc. Every time we commit a sin, at that moment we not, we not realize we're wounded, but later upon reflection we look upon ourselves and we we feel the woundedness it comes in the form of guilt looking at those things in the past so what happens is every time we commit a sin we're actually wounding ourselves which means we're detracting from our freedom ultimately then of course there's the wounds that other people cause to us there's the wounds that other people cause to us 
Now, a wound that other someone else causes is a form of violence. It's action that we have suffered contrary to the nature of what we're supposed to be. Let's take, for example, a child who's molested when it's young. The very nature of a child is innocence and a certain vulnerability, and, the require, and as a result of that, God entrusts them to good parents so that the parents will protect the, protect the child from getting wounded. It's a, so, and the child has a natural inclination to place themselves underneath a parent figure to protect them. They have that natural inclination. You see this all the time. When something really bad could happen, where does the kid run? It immediately runs to the mother in order to be protected, or to the father to be protected. So we have that natural inclination when we're younger. When they're molested, it goes completely contrary to that natural inclination and causes damage on an intellectual level because intellectually we're designed to function a certain way as children and when they go contrary to that it causes that damage. The way it causes that damage is, is this cogitative power I was talking about that has the ability of making associations. That, that evil action is now placed in, in the memory and then the cogitative power now associates with parent figure, father figure, not something that would be helpful to them, but something that's damaging, hurtful, and things like that. And that association is wound that needs healing. From that association then, because the cogitative power can make assessments of our images, and then as a result put a perspective on what we're experiencing, and then from that arises the emotions. So then the child becomes emotionally wounded as a result of that. That emotional woundedness means, though, that that association is not rightly ordered. The child doesn't have the ability to process that sufficiently on a psychological level to realize that was just, you know, so-and-so, it's not all men, it's not all this, and so, and I realize this is a problem that they have, and through forgiveness, etc., they can kind of, as adults, it's much easier for us to process that stuff. But with children, it's not. So, and even as adults, we can become wounded if we don't have sufficient virtue. In other words, if our faculties are perfectly ordered through virtue and bad things happen, we will immediately fall into the, I'm willing to suffer this for God's sake if this be his holy will, and so we can process it in a rightly ordered, in a reasonable way. But if we don't have that virtue and we don't have that perspective, we're going to become emotionally wounded from that. Then once we become emotionally wounded, then our emotions are much more sensitive. And as a result of that, what happens is, is we end up becoming much more bound psychologically. You see this all the time. People who have suffered traumatic events when they're younger, in, in, as children, struggle for that interior freedom. I just want to be freed from this. What, do they mean? what does that mean? I want this thing gone so that my faculties can function properly. So how do you heal? Well, for one thing, you can start developing virtue in those areas that, you know, that might be connected to it, and that'll help. But the other thing is, too, is, is that there's certain wounds, like minor wounds, that can basically time will heal them. But there are certain kinds of wounds that time will not heal. And there are certain kinds of wounds that we can heal on our own, and there's some certain kinds of wounds that we have to go to a physician for. The physician of our soul is Christ. He's the one who has to heal that woundedness. There are certain kinds of wounds that only he can heal. This pertains not just to the evil things that people may have done to us. It pertains to those sins. Every adult, almost, almost, almost every adult has some sin from their past for which they have woundedness from and which they feel guilty and they feel bad about, even though they know God has forgiven it. So, Christ has to heal that. Now, the flip side to that means you have to be willing to let him heal you. You can't sit there and, and hold on to that evil. Okay, so when someone does something evil against us, or when we do evil, St. Thomas says it's like it's sticking a knife in us, or someone sticking a knife in us. Then he says you have one of two choices. The first is called contraction which basically means you grab onto the thing, you contract around it and hold onto it so it doesn't get any deeper and so the wound doesn't cut any deeper. The problem is you're still holding onto the knife and it's not coming out and it's just sitting there festering over the course of time, it's just going to deteriorate. 
Whereas he says the other option is you can pull it out. Now the difficulty with pulling out is the initial pulling out is brutally painful. Why do people not let loose of the debt that other people do? Because that's what a wounded is. That's what woundedness is. It was a debt that somebody owed to us. They should have treated us in a particular way and they didn't. And as a result of that, now I'm stuck with this problem. And so this, this debt that this person owes to me, you have to, you have to let loose of that debt. You have to just say, I'm not going to seek after this person them to make the debt right. That's called forgiveness. You have to forgive people, not just as a matter of charity for those other people. You have to forgive those people for your sake. You will never attain spiritual perfection if you don't forgive the people for the things that they've done to you. But the same holds true for your own sin. If there's a sin in your life for which you feel guilty, in which you feel wounded from it, and that it still causes you pain to even think about it, then what you have to do is, you have to do one of two things. Well, first of all, you better get to confession. The second part of it, if you haven't confessed it already, but if you have confessed it, you have to let loose of the debt that you owe to yourself. In other words, you have to look at that and realize, as the Council of Trent says, that no man can stay out of mortal sin, even for a short period of time, without grace. There is no sin, no atrocity, no crime so heinous that none of us could commit it, that none of us wouldn't commit it if God retracted his grace for a short period of time. That's what the church teaches us formally. Just a short period of time, and every one of us would end up a Jeffrey Dahmer or one of these other people. So what this means is there's a certain humility that's required in recognizing without God's grace, this is what I'm capable of. God has let me see this so that I would humble myself before him. The second thing is you have to stop committing the sin of usurpation. What's the sin of usurpation? Usurpation is when you assume authority that you don't have. So when it comes to your forgiveness of yourself, if you go to confession and ask God for forgiveness and he forgives you, but you keep beating yourself over the head for what you've actually done, you are basically telling God, you're standing in God's judgment of his mercy for you and saying, even though you forgave him, I don't think it should be forgiven. You're not letting loose of the debt. So what does this mean? It means that part of that letting loose of your own sinfulness, letting loose of those things that you've done in the past, has to be done in order so that you can heal from that. You've got to pull the knife out or let someone else pull the knife out. Let Christ heal it. Now there's some things that we have a hard time letting loose of. You have to ask Christ, help me to give me the grace to let loose of this thing and please heal it. Because only he can heal it. He, there is a reason why he says, behold, I make all things new. It's in the New Testament. And basically what this means is, is that Christ through, the, um, through healing, through grace, can reorder the faculties. He can heal our memory by asking, if we ask for the grace of forgiveness, he can heal our memory so don't, we don't keep recalling it. He can heal, um, uh, but still give us a keen awareness of our ability to fall into that. He can heal this cogitative power so that it keeps associating everything in relationship to it. He can heal our emotions. He can heal the judgment of our intellect so that we don't keep looking at everything from that perspective. And in the end, he can heal our wills to where we can actually forgive ourselves and, and move past it. Once we let Christ heal us, then we're freed from these interior bonds of the lack of forgiveness or the trauma or the woundedness. And from that, we can have our interior freedom. That's what we have to seek for is that interior freedom. Now, the interior freedom is not the end, by the way, of the spiritual life. The end of the spiritual life is union with God. But the union with God comes through choosing to do His will. And so you're going to find it a lot easier to save your soul and get to heaven if you're choosing His will from this, and because you've worked on all these things and got them under control so that you've healed through that process. Okay. The one thing that I think that is important, especially for traditional Catholics, is people say, well, I have to make reparation for my sin. I hear this all the time. I say, indeed you do. 
St. Thomas, in his discussion in uh, the Summa, he makes the observation during his tract on justice, he says, there are certain kinds of violations of justice for which restitution cannot be made. And he gives the example of when a man rapes a woman, he is incapable of restoring the original order of justice in relationship to her. She's damaged. And now she's got to go through this whole process of working through it. If she's not perfectly virtuous, now she's got all this stuff she's got to deal with. And he can't repair that damage. He can't take it back. He can't make her non-raped anymore. Well, the same is true in relationship to our own sins. Do we have to make reparation? Yes, to the degree that we can. There are certain sins that we commit that we cannot make full restitution. And so as a result, we have to entrust them to the mercy of God. It doesn't mean you don't keep making reparation for your sins. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you make reparation for your sins, but then you leave it to God's mercy, the remaining part that you can't make. And you ask him, Jesus, through your mercy. I mean, he died on the cross. His mercy's mercy, the application of his mercy, he, it's, his mercy is infinite. The application comes through our participation in his cross. If we ask him, you know, through your cross, make restitution for the, or make reparation for those things that I cannot, he'll make it up. But we have to be willing to let him. And that means that we can't keep beating ourselves. There is a common misperception that perfection is something that an individual can, tame, can obtain on their own. This is absolutely absurd. It's based upon the principle of the principle of sufficient reason, which basically says, I'll give you the formal one and then explain it. The formal definition, or uh, sorry, the formal formulation of the principle of sufficient reason is the existence of a thing is accountable either in itself or in another. Colloquially, we will say, you can't give what you don't have. If I don't have a million dollars, I can't give myself a million dollars. Be very clear, you are not perfect. Therefore, you cannot make yourself perfect. Only Christ can make yourself perfect. What this means is, is if you look at the stages of the interior life, the initial stages, the act of purgation, stuff that we do on our own, but there comes a certain point where we peak out. We're, we've reached as far as we can on the natural order, of, or our natural order and on the order of ordinary grace. And it's at that point, it's a very pivotal time in a person's spiritual life, if they don't start ceding control to Christ over the purification and the healing process, what's going to happen is, is they're going to flatten out and plateau and usually they decline again. That ultimately perfection can only be reached when we cede complete control over the, our interior life over to Christ and cooperate with what He does. That means you have to put down the, thing, the, the instrument that you're using to flagellate yourself. You have to put it down, put it aside, and tell Christ, look, I've caused the damage. I can't get this straightened out. I'm a mess. You're going to have to clean it up in the end. Now, I know that grates against traditional Catholics because it's just like, but I, I can be perfect. Can. No, you can't. It's actually a form of Pelagianism to think that. And you have to stop that. It's heretical, actually. We can only become perfect through the action of God, who is perfect. He is the sufficient reason for us becoming perfect. And that means, therefore, that to attain perfect interior freedom, we have to concede complete control over not just our exterior life, but our interior life to Christ. It's the only way. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.